During this year of 2021, we're calling it our Focus on the Family, a time for us to focus on our families at home, but also here at Holy Family, a time for us to be able to focus on what it is that we do here at Holy Family every week. So last week we had a lesson on the ministry of sacristans, those people who work behind the scenes to prepare for and clean up after our liturgies. We are so extremely grateful to our sacristans. Next week's lesson will be on serving at the altar. What are things that we should know when we are assisting in the sanctuary of the church, helping out at the altar? This week's lesson, though, is on the ministry of hospitality. <coughs> we used to, or many churches refer to them as ushers. What we'd like to do is we'd like to, to, to frame this as being more than ushers. When you go to a wedding, you hear of the ushers, or the people who show you, their, who show you your seat. Obviously, those who are here at the church do more than ushering, which is why we refer to their ministry as the ministry of hospitality. We refer to them as hospitality ministers rather than as merely ushers. They may do some ushering, but they also are all about hospitality. So we just want to pause and thank all of our hospitality ministers. This lesson is hopefully for us to grow in our understanding of their ministry within the church. We begin, begin on page one of the notes. The scriptural basis of our hospitality ministry. We know that the Bible is divided into two parts. What are the two parts of the Bible? The we can all refer to that as the Old Testament and the New Testament. The New Testament was written in which language? In Greek, the language of the Roman Empire. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. So we often refer to these. Um, our Jewish brothers and sisters are offended when we use the words Old Testament and New Testament, which is why we prefer, we prefer to refer to them as the Hebrew Scriptures and the Greek or the Christian Scriptures. In the Hebrew Scriptures, then, we have various stories that deal with hospitality, how it is that if you're hospitable to others, you will be blessed. In the Hebrew Scriptures, there's this theme of Moses and the people wandering through the wilderness, through the desert. Do you remember that story? And so because of their experience of being displaced and of being in foreign lands, they had a special place in their heart for welcoming the strangers among us. According to the Hebrew scriptures, there are no strangers. We're supposed to treat everyone as we would treat our own family members. We see in the book of Leviticus, for example, that the Lord says, you shall have the same rule for the sojourner and for the native, for I am the Lord your God. We shouldn't be treating one class of people different from another. We shouldn't be treating foreigners or the foreign born or the immigrant any different than we would be treating the native born, those people who are from our own community. Leviticus chapter 19, when foreigners reside among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself. Job chapter 31, I have opened my doors to the traveler. A few questions we might ask ourselves then, both those who are in the ministry of hospitality, but all of us in the church, aren't we all called to be hospitable and to show how we live as sisters and brothers? Abraham and Sarah, do you remember their story in Genesis chapter 18? They received three strangers who were passing by, and as a result, do you remember what blessing they received, even though he was 100 and even though she was 90? They had a child. Do we treat strangers the same way as we treat others and outside the church? How hospitable are we? A good question, because sometimes when we come to church, we act holy, holy. The question would be, how holy, holy are we on Tuesday morning or Thursday evening or any other time during the week. So that's various examples of hospitality in the Hebrew <coughs> scriptures. Now we go down to the Greek scriptures or the Christian scriptures. In the Christian scriptures, the New Testament, we find various lessons on hospitality in the book of the Acts of the Apostles. The natives showed us extraordinary kindness. They kindled the fire and received us all first letter of Timothy, no widow may be put on the list of widows unless she is well known for her good deeds, such as bringing up children, showing hospitality, washing the feet of the Lord's people, etc. 
the book of Titus, an elder must be hospitable. Remember the word that we use in the church for priest? Priest really comes from the Greek word presbyteros, meaning the elder. All of us, you know, those who are in the room, most of us are elders. I include myself in the elder group. We're called to be hospitable. Romans, Paul's under the Romans, practice hospitality. First letter of Peter, offer hospitality to, no, to one another without grumbling. So we see various examples in both of these of hospitality. The other story that comes to mind is that of Martha and Mary. Do you remember the story of Martha and Mary? Jesus went to their home, and what did Martha do? She got busy. In fact, there's a good balance in here because Martha's the one who's active and busy. Mary's the one who's tending to Jesus. So maybe our hospitality is about both things, both tending to the person, but also tending to his or her needs. We're just going to uh, go to page two. The Bible telling us about Christ coming to us through others. The book of Hebrews, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels. What's the story here? When you do something good for someone, you're doing it for an angel, an angel in disguise. Matthew chapter 25, the story of the sheep and the goats. Do you remember that parable? Whenever you did this for one of the least of my brothers and sisters, who did you do it for? For Jesus. Remember when Jesus talked about the final judgment separating the sheep from the goats? He says in one crowd, come into my kingdom. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in the prison, you, you visited me. Lord, when did we ever do that? When did we do it? Anytime that we did something good for another person, we're doing it for Christ. So hospitality ministers and all of us, think about that for a moment, every person who walks into the church is Christ. It's easy for us to be friendly and nice to the people that we recognize and the people that we like, the people that we see every Sunday. How hospitable are we being to those who are joining us for the first time? Are we treating them any differently? Especially those who dress a little differently, or talk a little differently, or smell a little differently, etc. The scriptures present us real challenges reflecting on how it is that we treat one another. <clears throat> the theology of the hospitality ministry then is all about, it's, it's not about showing people to their seats so much as it is about being Christ to those people. When someone comes to our church, we are going to find a way to welcome them so that they feel like they're coming home, so that they feel that they're part of the family, so that they're not leaving thinking, oh, did you notice how they treated that person really nice? They really didn't say anything to me. Right? We want to make sure that everyone who comes to the church feels welcomed and part of the family. The golden rule, remember the golden rule in the Gospel of Matthew, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Maybe that's a big challenge for all, all of us, not just hospitality ministers, but all of us. If you, if you were going to a church for the first time, how would you want people to treat you at that church? Because that's how we're challenged to treat those who are coming to us for the first time. <clears throat> Practically speaking, then, what does it mean to be a hospitality minister? Hospitality ministers serve many functions. You are the hands and the face of our church. Father Jamie... Father Roy, Father Lee Barber, we're often busy doing different things, getting ready for Mass, and all the ones who are at the door are saying welcome to people. People come to you with their questions. They don't seek out the priest to ask where's the restroom. They look to the person who's, you know, who's able to answer that question, the, people, the person inside the door. So as hospitality ministers, it's important for us to be able to know how to answer some of those questions that they'll come to us with. Where's the restroom? Where's the parish office? Many times people will want to say the prayer for a special intention. Oh, Father, can you offer Mass for my sister who died last night? Okay, who are they going to come to with that sort of information? Hospitality ministers being inside the front door are going to be natural <coughs> persons, and then people will say, ooh, how can, I, how can I offer Mass for this or that intention? Our solution here at Holy Family is typically to tell people to write it down on a post-it note. Father hospitality ministers write down a post-it note, slip it to the priest before Mass, and then the priest has it in his or her hand. Always phrasing things in the nicest possible way. 
So we remember that there are certain, before we talked about morals, but it's not even about morals, it's more about how it is that we as society have different expectations for one another. We call them mores. And so one would be, for instance, oh, that you don't chew mass, chew gum in, in church. Okay? Different generations look at these things differently. Because I remember being the pastor of a church where there was a lot of bubble gum up underneath the um, underneath the pews. I totally am with you. So the challenge becomes how do you find the nicest possible way to tell that person who's chewing gum that, oh, look, we, we provide the service of, here's a waste uh, a trash can if you, if you need a place to go to, to, to stick your gum before going to the church. There are people who will leave the church and never come back, or at least not for a while, because of things that are said to them. I've heard these stories, right? Once that I remember a grouchy old hospitality minister or usher who told a woman that her dress was too short and turned her away from the church. Oh my well, gosh. It happens, right? So we ultimately have to decide, are we more focused on what's on the outside? Or are we most more focused on the inside and saying, well, praise the Lord that she came to church. She may be a little distracting for some <laughs> folks. <laughs> but praise the Lord that she's here, right? I mean, obviously the way that he barked at her, he drove her away, and uh, we just think we need to be conscious of the messages that we send to people. Um, another famous example is of crying children. The great thing about crying children is that by having crying children, they are, they, they are healthy and have healthy lungs. It's often our temptation to look at those people in mean ways because we're distracted during prayer. Maybe it's the hospitality ministers who could let them know with a smile that, ooh, we have a place for you to be able to, to, to be while your child is restless. We call it our cry room, or here at Holy Family, when you close the inner doors between the narthex and the nave, remember those words from last week? Then suddenly that creates a sort of cry room on the other side of those windows. We try to see the mass through the experience of others who come here and join us uh, here at Holy Family. We're going to pause there before we get into concretes of before what it is that that hospitality ministers do before mass, during mass, and after mass. Any questions or comments so far? Any bad experiences that we've had with hospitality ministers or ushers, or good experiences that we've had? I think one of the beautiful things here at Holy Family is that we are family. So often, you know, we get to know people's names and we say hello. The challenge that we might have here is figuring out how do we show that same friendliness and family spirit to that person who's here for the first time that we don't know. Is there a way to learn his or her name to make him or her feel welcome? Ready? Love that way. I, I had the experience of, for the first time with uh, the lady that came in. and. Uh, you probably know who I'm talking about. With she brought, uh, her, she brought, brought her dog in here in a little cage. That's a perfect example. Go and, for it. And I, I, that was the first time for me, yeah. you know. And I didn't know how to yeah. approach that. I just didn't know what to do. Excellent question. So it's the example. Of different people that come to us with different needs. So, you know, we've had an occasion, and I've had in other places too, where a person will come, for instance, with an emotional support animal of some kind. Hopefully that's more resembling a cat or a dog than, say, a snake. But, you know, different people, for whatever reasons, they come to church dressed in different ways and carrying different things, literally and figuratively. And then we just have to decide, what does that, what do we do with that? You know, how do we, what do we say and do in those situations? I have a feeling many of us were raised to think certain things about church, like, you have to dress a certain way and act a certain way and sit a certain way and et cetera, which would exclude many things like many dresses, maybe even emotional support animals, or whatever else, crying kids. We have to ask ourselves some real questions. You know, I think I think my take at the Spanish mass we've seen, I don't even want to say that they're <coughs> emotional support animals because it just seems like people bring their pets to church at our 12 o'clock mass, we would see like a baby stroller coming in with like three or four dogs for those who remember those stories. It's sort of like, 
on the one hand, it's showing compassion. There's how many churches in Austin? Or that would be an excellent question. What would be the message? Is wouldn't it be interesting as a, as an experiment? If there's a, a child who's in school who'd like to do a like a psychological study for us, we'd encourage them to take a stroller filled with dogs to different churches on Sunday to see the different reactions, what people say and what people do. As part of that experiment, when they come to Holy Family, at least in the past, we've seen different dog strollers just walk right on in, and the stroller or dogs is there in the front of the church. And, you know, frankly, so long as they're not making a lot of noise during the church, it's not a big deal, at least to this priest. But I know different people look at that in different ways and think, well, that's not, that's not right. That, that was my first reaction. And, and, <laughs> but after, after a while, nobody said anything. I guess it's okay, you know. So, so I, I accept it now. I remember saying, I remember celebrating Mass in Mexico in different places where it's sort of like you're in outdoor sorts of places where, you know, the dogs and the chickens sort of wander in and out during Mass. And it's just, it's part of the Mexican experience of celebrating Mass in a different way than here in North America in, in the United States. We tend to think in a very different way, in a stricter way about Mass. Your baby's crying. Take your baby outside. Which is fine. We can say that. Maybe the child is refining the most delicate and or best way to say that to a person. How, what's, the, what's the most delicate words to say to a person who's chewing gum? Or who has that mini dress? Or who brings in the stroller of dogs in the mess? What's the impact of those things on others? How do we help to educate them on how those things affect others? Whether it's the gum that's chewed and left underneath the bench, whether it's the distracting way of dressing. When we come to the lesson on lectures, I'll tell the story of the tiger lady, the woman who wore a, a sweater. She's proclaiming the word of God wearing this big tiger on her sweater. So when you know we're trying, like, trying to listen to her proclaiming the word of God, and we're just thinking, we're just all distracted by the tiger. <laughs> how do you find the, the, the most polite words to say, we love how you proclaim the word, and we were so distracted by the tiger. <laughs> right? Because we're, we're working with pieces after all, and uh, it, it would be interesting to see the, ver the response to the various churches, the various, to the various situations, because that's not unique to Holy Family. The tiger lady is in every in every congregation. The gum chewer, those who dress less appropriately, those who bring animals to church. There are going to be all sorts of examples of different ways, and we have to figure out as a, as a family, as a community, how do we respond to this? Now, if someone comes to me and says, "Father, I'm allergic to cats," and so the stroller of cats is is causing a problem, that, then that's probably something that as a family we need to find a way to address in a different way that it's, no one's allergic to cats. And in fact, it's for all cat lovers. It's for a family of cat lovers. And they're, oh, oh, look at those cats, they're so cute. <laughs> That's a tough one, Louise, because if you are my age or older, you were raised in a church where there were various rules. You, do, you don't do certain things in church. Further thoughts on that, Rudy and or others? During View from the Few, everybody's like got different stories, but one of the common things that I see that they say is that everybody feels welcome at Holy Family. So I'll, to me, that says like our hospitality ministers are doing something right. Everybody's story is different, but that's the one common element in everybody's View from the Pew. I think that's cool. How cool is it? The word that we use in the church and in ministry is pastoral. P-A-S-T-O-R-A-L. Anyone speak Spanish? What's the, what is pastor in Spanish? Shepherd. So having a pastoral spirit means that in those situations, it's how do we respond in a pastoral way? You know, how do we, as good shepherds and shepherdesses, what do we say and do in those situations? As priests, we think about it all the, all the time. If I'm with someone who's on his or her deathbed, Right, this may be the last time that I see him or her. How am I going to be pastoral with that person? How am I going to be a good shepherd with that sheep? With anyone who comes to this church, we have this we have this challenge of being pastoral. Let's be 
because what we say and what we do can draw that sheep in and or leave that sheep running off to other shepherds. How beautiful to hear a holy family. We, we take in sheep that have been driven off from other places. Other places who said, you can't come in here with that mini dress or without your head covered or whatever it is that they say. We say, the dress is a little <laughs> revealing, but you're a child of God and love him. We really appreciate your, your raising that because there, there are various times when we all are in those situations, even the priests looking at one another and we're like, oh, we good this. Every time we have the St. Francis blessing, October the 4th, every time we have that blessing, if I people bring it back to church, we've got to expect some people rolling their eyes or saying, what is going on here? Hmm. They're talking about some of the things that hot family ministers do before Mass. Before Mass, the thing that we have to think about is how is it we look to others? So others are going to be seeing us, the hands and the heart and the face of Christ. So what do they see when they look to you? Did they see someone with disheveled hair? Someone who looks like they just uh, rolled out of bed in the morning? Someone whose breath is really a little difficult to <laughs> bear with? Um, so we want to pay attention to how it is that we look. Number two, name tags are such a beautiful thing. Different churches have different customs with this. At least the last time that we did, that we put this guide together, we had magnetic name tags. I'd be happy for us as a church to purchase magnetic name tags for every hospitality minister so that every time someone comes in, they're able to say, oh, hey, your name is Lewis, Rudy, John, Leonard, Ramiro. Yeah. Let's see. Name tags is always a good thing. When you do wear name tags, the important thing is to be able to wear them in such a way that people can see them. I always say that the button that we find, like where do I put my lapel pin? It's always on that uh, that buttonhole that's always sort of shut. That's a great place to put things. But typically, if, if it's a name tag, it goes on the right hand side so we see the name tag before we see the face. Name tags, always a good idea for us to minister. Arriving early. There are some people who think, oh, I'm going to be an usher at church today. Mass is at 9, so I'll get there at 9. No, <laughs> if you're going to be a hospitality minister, that means you've got to be at the church before anyone else gets to the church. If you're not the first one at church, then how are you going to say hi, hi to everyone else? Okay. So part of being a hospitality minister means having the discipline of arriving 20 or 30 minutes early to be able to welcome people as they come. It's no, it's no use. There, there are masses at this church and others where the hospitality minister arrives during the first reading. I appreciate, I appreciate <laughs> the fact that, you, that you're here, but hospitality ministry is showing up a lot earlier than the first reading. Don't preach. <laughs> Think about how the church appears. The hospitality minister can only think, can be thinking not only about him or herself, but also, wait a minute, when a person walks into this space, what do they see? Do they see clutter? Do they see dirt on the floor? Do they see concrete or sidewalk that's unswept? Right? How it is that we can use our own eye? If I'm there 20 or 30 minutes earlier and there's no one there, then it's an opportunity for us to be able to look around and see, ooh, for the person who's coming here for the first time, let, let me imagine stepping into this church for the first time, what would I see? What catches my eye? A smile, regardless of what's going on in your life, the challenge of hospitality ministers that day is to radiate the love of Christ. It can be tough. Don't get me wrong. You just found out some bad news as you were driving to church. If you're a hospitality minister and you have a cloud hanging over your head, maybe it's better not to be a hospitality minister that morning. Maybe it's better to... Or, or find some way before you step out of the car to say, Dark cloud, I'll be right back to you after Mass, but right now I'm going to leave you in the car. Welcome everyone, simply meaning that the importance here is that, uh, as Stephen points out, there's so many people who come here to Holy Family and say, I feel at, at home and family here. We want to make sure that everyone who comes in these doors feels that way, which means that if I'm saying, and that's one of the reasons why if during communion, do you ever notice that? Sometimes there are some priests in some churches who say, Jordan, the body of Christ. Stephen, the body of Christ. I love it. It's a nice personal gesture, but then what happens when I come to the next person, I'm like, oh. I don't know your name, the body of Christ. 
right? How do we in hospitality minister show an equal treatment to everyone so that if I can say hello to Jordan, if I can say hello to Stephen, then what does that mean for this first time visitor? Because I don't know his or her name. And suddenly she's getting, he or she is getting the message that, oh yeah, he says hello to Jordan, hello to Stephen, but he doesn't even know my name. How is that, how is that become for, what a nice game that becomes for hospitality ministers to sort of have this game of remembering a person's name. Hey, my name is Rudy. And then remembering that person's name. Educational psychologists, don't they say that you have to repeat something seven times or find some association in your mind to be able to remember it? So once they tell you that name once, because they're only going to tell it to you once unless you ask them again, then you have to figure out, okay, how am I going to remember that person's name? So when that person comes out of church or during the sign of peace, that I can say, oh, peace be with you, Susie. Peace be with you, Juan. Oh, you remember my name. People. That, that goes a long way. When you ask a person's name, but then call them by that name. We've all heard of a book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People, where the first rule is always use a person's name. That person's name is his or her most important possession. Learn their name. Ooh. How's that for a challenge? So, we have your various ways to remember names, right? Find a way to memorize names, either saying it silently, they say their name to you, and then you repeat a sentence. Hey, my name is Susie. Oh, and then you say to yourself, Susie, 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 Susie. Or finding some association. Susie, oh, you remind me of my Aunt Susie. When I, every time I see you, I'm going to think of my Aunt Susie. Right? Finding some way to be able to remember their name. We share a kind word with everyone. Oh, I didn't say, when we, when we find out that person's name, too, another way to remember that person's name is to keep using that person's name. Say, hey, Susie, so glad to have you here at Holy Family. Rudy, been coming here for a long time. Glad to have you here. Let me introduce you to Lewis. Hey, Lewis, Lewis, Susie, Susie, Lewis. Leonard, have you met Susie? Susie, Leonard, Leonard, Susie. Huh. Sharing a kind word with everyone. You know, if we are family, one of the characteristics of family is getting to know one another, so it's asking questions. You know, when they come back the second week, hey, it's great to see you again. How was your week? Tell me, what do you do outside? You know, ask them about family life, work life, get to know them, talk, talk about, you know, what matters to them. Each person coming to the church should receive and I, I list out here, I say a smile. Isn't it nice to have someone smile at you? The kindest possible welcome, some kind words, and a mass program. Here at Holy Family, we share a mass program with everyone so that people know uh, what it will be singing. So rather than just leaving the mass programs over in a basket somewhere or on a table somewhere, it's an opportunity for us to be able to say, hey, here's a mass program. Hope you, hope you join us in singing and praying. <coughs> Glad to have you here. What do we do to accommodate those who have special needs, like those in wheelchairs or walkers? You know, as hospitality ministers, we can be thinking through that and thinking, okay, if someone comes in here in a wheelchair, what can we do for him or her, right? How can we help him or her to find a place? This is where you become an usher, right? When the hospitality minister tries to find a place for him or her, for us in the front of the church, typically a space for wheelchairs, we need to be thinking, boy, what if we had three or four wheelchairs come? We'd have to find a way to be creative. Our aisle is so narrow that sometimes if you like put a walk or something in the aisle, it could be inconvenient. That's an opportunity for the hospitality minister to be able to say, hey, welcome, so glad to have you with us. Do you mind? I'm just going to pull your walker back into the entrance and hand a mask. I'll bring it right back to you, okay? <laughs> that brings us down to the next section, which is one of Father Jamie's peeves, and that is about church bells. Have you ever thought about why we have church bells? Church bell is a signal that we're getting ready to start the Mass. So a church bell is an important part of prayer here. That is to say, it can be it can be a nice experience of hearing a bell ring, or it can be distracting. And so I write here that no one, with italics on the no one, no one should ever ring a church bell for the first time at the church without having practiced it. Meaning, I think it'd be particular, but there's a certain way that you bring a church bell. Every. Right? 
if you're in Holy Family, for instance, we have a bell that tilts back and forth, so it has a, a double a, a double sound as it swings back and forth. Ding, 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 ding. And so it's, it's, it's being able to make that sound with the bell, because if you're just trying it for the first time, and, and it's like you're not really sure what how to do this, the people notice and it becomes more distracting than anything. This is not a chance for you to say to your child, the grandchild, hey, do you want to ring the bell? No. Unless they practice ringing the bell and ring the bell well, <laughs> then don't do it. Step away, step away from the bell. Ring the bell well. Right. Here at Holy Family, we, we, tend, we recognize that there's an upward and a downward movement of the rope for the swing of ding, 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 ding. So we try to do that <clears throat> movement about 12 to 15 cycles. Um, it communicates a message. So. We want that to be a, a good, rather than a distracting message communicated by whoever's ringing the bell. We're going to pause there for the details that happened before Mass. Any questions or comments on what it is that ministers of hospitality, hospitality do before the Mass gets started? <clears throat> Once Mass gets started then, we want to fight the temptation to seat people. Sometimes we'll be in the middle of a reading, and we'll be listening to the lecture, and Terry or Becky or Jordan or Stephen or anyone, Mario, will be reading the reading so beautifully. And then for those of us who are listening to them, we are so distracted by that hospitality minister thinking that he or she needs to see someone during the reading. Playing through this. Okay, someone's coming in the door, we get it. But it's sort of like it's like going to the theater, right? Going to the opera. You know? When the opera starts, the doors close and then they let you in at the end of Act One or something. We don't want to necessarily be like that strict, but at the same time, we, there's nothing wrong in saying to a person, as soon as, as soon as this reading is over, I'll show you to a seat. And as soon as the reading is over, rather than distracting people by walking in while we're trying to listen to Mario, Mario proclaim the word of God, then wait until Mario finishes the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Ooh, there we go, let me show you to your seat. Love it, you just, you just, you just saved us all from being distracted while Mario is proclaiming the word. <coughs> We're off to the next page. Another thing that we do here at Holy Family is we keep a count of people. We may not know the things that happen behind the scenes, but we have a historical record. We have the attendance at, at all masses that we've remembered to track since the very beginning of this church. And so it's the hospitality minister to help us with that historical record, right? And so the, it, it sounds as simple as counting people during mass, but it's really it's adding to the historical documents of this church. Okay, I'm going to count some people. And then the question becomes, how do you count the people? I remember in some churches, you know, because I tend to say this to, to the hospitality ministers every church I go to, I want to know how many people there were after Mass. I'll never forget some of the more distracting ones. They, like, will, the, the, the hospitality ministers, the ushers, they'll come up, like, in the middle of the, the people, like, I'm trying to preach in the front of the church, and they're, like, halfway up the aisle going like this. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> You recognize what you're doing. Trying to preach. I, I would love for them to, to take something away from the comedy, but they are so distracted by you going like this. Right? The trick to that use is instead of I mean, the challenge of us becomes how do we find a place where we're discreet? People don't need to know that we're counting at every mass. I know here at Holy Family, a lot of people will go up into the choir loft and count from above, like during the homily. If you don't even want to use your hands and do that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the, the, the notes, the hints that I give here is in your head, count by twos, group people by twos. So I'm counting two, four, six, eight. Right? And then and count in different ways. You don't have to count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Instead you can go two, four, six, eight, ten, two, four, six, eight, twenty, two, four, six, eight, thirty, two, four, six, eight, forty, two, forty three people. I didn't even use it. I have to use my fingers. <laughs> Write down the number of people present. Put it in the piece of paper that goes into the collection basket. For those who don't know what goes on behind the scenes, that number then goes to the parish office. It's entered into a database. And we have the numbers that we chart. And we have these charts of like how attendance goes up and down. Next big point, effect knowing how to to help the flow of traffic. That's especially important in a place like Holy Family because that aisle is so narrow. In many churches, you can have 
people coming up the side aisle and then going back, excuse me, up the middle aisle, going back on the side aisles. We don't have that side aisle opportunity or advantage here. So here at Holy Family, we actually got, how do we get people up to communion and back from communion? And how do we as hospitality ministers stay out of the way? Which is why we have this system perfected where we always start at the same part of the church when we're outside of the pandemic. We start at the upper east side, the upper right side as you're looking toward the altar, the stage left side. We start there, and what we do is, as hospitality ministers, we start with our back to the altar because we're directing the people around us to go up that side. We're trying to create this, we're trying to create a clockwise flow of people. And the way that I do that is not by standing behind them and just saying, go on up, because then they're just gonna go up the middle of the aisle. What I do is I put myself on this side of the aisle, invite them out around me, and suddenly they're starting to create this, this clockwise flow. And as I take a step back to the next one, then it's allowing them to come back into their seats. Ooh. I get to the back of the church then, I'm inviting people to go up then in that same sort of clockwise thing. But instead of standing in front again, like I was doing in that, on the other side, I'm standing in front of the pew and having them go around me. When I'm coming up the other side, I don't do that because then, they, then I'm, I'm getting in the way of traffic. Instead, I invite them out to come in front of me on the side. So it takes some practice, but think about how do I help to coordinate the flow of traffic here without me getting in the way? I've seen that where ushers will come up the other side, sort of like coming up and inviting people out around them, and no, so suddenly you've just, you've just, you're creating a, you're creating a problems with the traffic flow here. Think through before the mass starts. How it is that you and the hospitality minister are going to contribute for that? We often are waiting for hospitality minister, so it's always great. The first sub point there, you know, when you're able to have people who are ready and standing when the priest is ready to give communion, because there are so often times when the priest is there ready to give communion, and then it takes like 40 seconds. Okay, I'm ready. Okay, anytime you want to send someone. Hello, hello. So it's, it's hospitality ministers who can help to solve all of that, right? Okay, I'm not telling you, I'm doing communion, I'm gonna be up there in time, and make sure that the people are, are by the time the priest arrives at that step, there's gonna be someone there to <coughs> We have various directions on how it is that we do the flow here at Holy Family. Um, we've seen hospitality ministers standing beside the priest, trying to direct them, like when we have three communion cups. Boy, it's been almost a year since we've had communion cups now. But there's something beautiful about having a hospitality minister up there and being able to say, oh, you know, be able to point out, you know, where they can help help them with the flow of traffic up there as well. Again, the challenge is how do we do that in a discreet way that's not that's not distracting, you know, it's not, it's not finding ways that are distracting from that whole prayer, but eventually helping to facilitate the flow of traffic during that time. Top of page five, taking up the collection is an important part of the role of the hospitality minister. The collection is an important part of what sustains us as a community. We so grateful, we're so grateful to all who help to support us. Many people support us in different ways. Some people, they support us in the church by bringing gifts and putting them into the collection basket. So we need to think as hospitality ministers, what's the most effective and efficient way for me to take up this collection? How can I take up this collection in the quickest possible way, but making sure that, it's, uh, that it reaches everyone? What I suggest in here is that we have enough baskets on hand that we can send baskets here at Holy Family. They don't have a side aisle. And so it's almost like getting, it's helping people to understand, okay, we're gonna pass this down this aisle, th this pew, and then we're gonna pass it back to the row, back to the, the aisle. You know, and if I have two baskets, then I'm doing it in half the time. Think about that. Often we see just a person coming up with one basket and passing it. Okay, you could, you could do it in half the time by just passing two baskets instead. Put one in the first pew, put one in the third pew, they'll come back through the second and fourth pews, and then you just keep going back and you just did it in half the time. That's important here at Holy Family because often we'll have, sometimes we'll have more than one collection, and so if it takes a long time, then, then, then we're just drawing out the mass needlessly. Rudy. Sometimes when you're, when you're putting a basket over there, it, uh, I'm not. I'm not sure what it, what is proper to put it in front of the table or to the side of the table. 
excellent question. So every church will, will have different ways of doing it. I mean, it seems that the message that we have is the symbolism is we're gathering together all of our gifts and taking them to the altar. And so it seems that an appropriate place would be like, say, you know, in front of the altar or somewhere around there. You know, part of the symbolism is, you know, we're, 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 I'm giving you money. How do I know that someone's not walking off with that money? Right? And so by ensuring that it's sort of like, okay, it comes into the basket and then goes right. in a certain spot. Right. Say, in front of the altar, or if there's something in front of the altar, I know we have the Christmas crest that's in front of the altar until this weekend, right? Maybe it's somehow beside that or in some space so that it's not. What happens is we refer to them as internal controls. You know, we don't want anyone to ever be accused of doing something that they didn't do. So that, for instance, at the 12 o'clock mass, for the sake of efficiency, it's the last mass of the day. We have volunteers who count that money. And so instead of making them wait until the end of mass to get the money, what we do is we have that money taken over to the parish office instead of to the altar. The challenge is this. If I give the basket to Jordan, sorry, pick on you, Jordan. If I give the basket to Jordan, we all know and love Jordan, but the moment that I give him the basket and he runs it over to the office, anyone can accuse him of doing something that he did not do. Follow me? Which is why it's so important for us as a community, every time, anytime it comes to money, especially cash, that we never we never want to put anyone in a situation of being accused of something they didn't do. Don't ever give money to a single person. Make sure that there's always a certain buddy system so that no one can ever accuse anyone, okay? By Stephen and Jordan going to the office together, or even better, two people from two, two different families. Often churches will have, as part of their internal control, that people of the same family don't count money together because then they can say, ooh, yeah, I bet they're slipping themselves something. No, you we don't even want people to think that, right? Suddenly when Terry and Jordan walk the money to the parish, to the parish office, no one's able to say, oh, well, I bet, no, 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 don't even go there. You know, we, we, it's finding a way to protect one another, which is the purpose of internal controls. You're always thinking about any time that you send a basket of money with a single person, even Father Jamie, you'll notice that I never touch the basket of money ever in this parish. Because I will never have anyone say that I did something that I didn't do. That's something as a young priest I learned. It. I learned that from an old priest. He was just like, don't ever touch the basket. Um, the, the last point that I have when it comes to the collection is always starting from the front of the church. Whether that's the collection, whether it's passing something out. Oh, today we'd like to pass out a prayer card. What we do is we start at the front of the church so that people see us. What happens if we start at the back of the church? There's sort of like this surprise element where it's like, oh, what is this person doing coming up behind me? If you're coming up to the front of the church, whether it's with a collection basket or with whatever gift that we're sharing that day, then suddenly they're seeing you as you're coming toward them rather than you sneaking up on them and, and them being surprised. So I always encourage whatever it is that anytime ushers are interacting with people, do it from the front of the church backwards so that people see you coming. After Mass, we love our hospitality ministers who understand that their ministry doesn't begin at the time of first. Oh, I'm going to just show up at the first reading. No. If you're there 20 or 30 minutes before Mass, that's a tremendous help to us. If you stay after Mass, you go high on the list of saints in this church because after Mass, we all just want to get home. So I just hold in high, high esteem anyone who stays after the Mass. Hospitality ministers especially have that chance to be the ones to be able to to be the last ones to say goodbye to a people, to the people, right? You memorize Susie's name when she came into the church. This is the time for you to be able to say, Susie, glad you could make it. Will I see you next week? Oh, you just you just helped us to win win over a person there. You were like Andy in today's gospel, bringing someone to Jesus. We have here various things because we know that. Our custom before the pandemic was to have a 9 o'clock Mass in the church, then a 10.30 Mass in the chapel, then a 12 o'clock Mass in the church, so we have different details that we do here at Holy Family to be able to sort of transition between the Masses. Anytime that hospitality ministers are able to help with that, it's always a tremendous help. You know, we have to, here at Holy Family, we have this baptismal font and flags and images and various things that we do as part of the transition. And there are so many people, especially our sacristans, who are working to help prepare 
for our masses and camp after our masses, they always, always welcome the help of hospitality ministers who are willing to roll up their sleeves and help. Bottom of page six, we come to the role of a coordinator. We currently don't have this at Holy Family, but one of my dreams, and I've been dreaming this for a few years now, is wouldn't it be, be lovely if there was someone who, who would be able to say, I'm going to be the coordinator of the 9 o'clock Mass, or the 10.30 Mass, or the 12 o'clock Mass. Great. Suddenly I know, or all the Masses, suddenly I know if I need to give a special instruction. Oh, today we're going to have a special prayer card we're going to give out to people. Or, oh, today's our raffle for, what do we call it, our Kindles for Kids raffle. Because we don't have a coordinator currently, thank you, Becky and Terry. I'm like going to Becky and saying, oh, Terry, today we have our Kindles for Kids raffle. Poor Terry. Thank you, Terry. It, essentially, Terry is being the coordinator of our hospitality ministers on that morning. You know, if we had someone who is willing to do that, then I'm able to send that person a text and say, hey, we have a special this or that this weekend, special instruction. In, in the light of the absence of that, number two says, before Mass, the coordinator would touch base with the presider. You know, the priest always comes to the entrance of the church before starting the Mass. That's a, a, it's a perfect time for any one of the hospitality ministers to ask, hey, Father, anything we need to know? Many times it would be, nope, let's get control on the road. Other times they're like, oh, yeah, we need to do this. Oh, we have two collections today, whatever special instructions we might have. The coordinator then would be responsible for making sure that all of the above details are followed and are smoothly effected. They would find the kindest possible way to help others perfect their ministry. Right now we don't have any accountability. We don't have anyone who's helping us to learn in various ministries. Wouldn't it be cool if there was someone who wanted to take on the proclaimers of the word or the altar servers or the, the, the hospitality ministers afterward to be able to find a nice possible way to be able to say, ooh, I just love, thank you for being a hospitality minister. Um, this is one thing that we have on our guidelines that we might be able to improve next time. The way that you barked at that person. <laughs> you know, helping people to, finding the, the nicest possible way to be able to help people to grow. After Mass, they might touch base with the presider of the priest to see if there are any growing edges. Hey, Father, how do we do? Anything we need to improve next time? Oh, great. If you ask me, I may, may have something for you. Otherwise, I'll say, no, you are an absolute saint. <laughs> um, and that also helps to give us some, some consistency to know because right now at Holy Family, what we have is we love our volunteers, but we also recognize that being a volunteer and having other commitments in the world means that the priest, Father Jamie, Father Roy, Father Eduardo, anyone who comes to the family, we don't know who to count on from one Sunday to the next, because that's just the nature of, of ministry at Holy Family. Other churches would have fancy schedules to be able to know, you know who's on. This weekend we don't have anything like that, so we just we do, do the best we can with what we have. Number page seven. You'll see this in green font, which means that it's new since the last time that we printed these. And this section is written in a world of mass shootings in churches. Mm -hmm. I hate to even mention it, but, you know, that unfortunately we live in a world where there are people who walk into churches with crazy ideas in their head. The note that I make here is simply that we need to be aware of First of all, that as a church, we attract all sorts of people, which is a beautiful thing. But one of the reasons that mass shooters, if we were to say it that plainly, like schools and churches, is because you just don't expect mass shootings in these places. You don't go to church to be shot. You don't go to school to be shot. I mean, you, you, these are supposed to be safe places. The challenge that we have is that churches attract certain personality types. They attract many healthy personality types, but also there are certain psychiatric symptoms that manifest themselves in religious sorts of symptoms, and we just need to be aware of that. I've been a priest now for nearly 20 years, and I've seen all sorts of beautiful, lovely people in different stages of health. And so I, I just make us aware that we're called to be the hands and the heart of Christ for all people. Some people 
get it in their get it in their head that they need to take a gun to some of these places. It does us well to think through as hospitality ministers. We don't discuss any of this on Facebook and give away any of our plans, but you know, at our board meetings as a church, or for us to talk about offline, you know, what would we do? What would I do if I were a hospitality minister and someone came into the church and I could tell that he or she were armed in some way? What would I say? What would I do? As your pastor, I've thought through this. I mean, after you see a few church shootings, you just have to think through this. So I, I have a plan in my head for what I as a priest would do if God forbid that should ever happen in our church, but I think it does us well not just to have one person think about what he or she would do, but for all of our hospitality ministers, maybe have that conversation after a Sunday. What do you do? I've been thinking about this. What, what would we do? What would I do? What would you do? How would we respond to this together? How would I respond to this if you weren't here? How would you respond to it if I weren't here? God forbid, let's hope we never have to even think about this, but because there are people in this world who get crazy ideas in their head, it's something that's now part of the reality of any church. There's no place to run <laughs> in the church. We certainly would want to think about, I mean, it just seems that the hospitality ministers, the person in the second pew in the front of the church is not going to, to be, to see a mass shooter before the person who's at the door. You know what I mean? It seems like the hospitality ministers have a special role in responding to those situations. You know, how do we do it in the safest possible way to protect ourselves and as many people as possible Let's not talk anymore about that this evening. Yeah, we can talk about these things offline as we mm -hmm. think about these things and pray about these things. We don't want to ever live in fear. We just want to acknowledge that probably a uh, good idea and know that our Holy Family Board of Directors has talked about the issue before. You know, if we were to ever have a, a shooter situation, what would we do? Probably better for us to think through those sorts of things. Conclusion. Dang, I guess it's really not just about being an usher and showing up at during the first reading and thinking that I'm taking out the collection. It's a whole ministry of welcoming people as they come to church, of doing various tasks before and during and after Mass, and also being the last ones who are saying goodbye to people and being real ambassadors and faces of our parish. So we just want to pause and thank all of those who are hospitality ministers here at Holy Family. All of us, really, all of us are about the task of hospitality for those who step up and who serve inside the doors of the church. In the narthex or in the vestibule, as hospitality ministers, it's a, it's a special ministry that certainly we don't take lightly. We'll pause there for concluding questions, comments, observations, remarks. Are we going to start going to Mass? Excellent question. So, Mario, <coughs> Mario, you have an excellent... I mean, why are we even talking about these things when we're going to Mass? <laughs> right now, so long as we're at COVID level 5, we are not going to Mass in person. As soon as, as soon as Austin says we're back at level 4, praise the Lord, our doors are open. So, for anyone who's listening to us on Facebook, once we, we're now at level 5, we're not going to be gathering at church. Even in, on a night like this, we're, we're very spaced. For church on Sunday, though, so long as we're at level five, no church, no mass. As soon as, they, as soon as we drop to level four, we're going to send a text message out to everyone. We're going to post it on our Facebook. Holy Family is open again. Oh, I can't wait. Let's get through this pandemic. 4,000 people died yesterday in the United States from COVID. Let's get through this. 375,000 people, we pray for them. Their families all affected. This is, this is no joke. We families in the parish who've been through this. Fortunately, we've not experienced a lot of death to the parish family, but let's, let's be safe for a few more weeks and months. Vaccine's on its way. Just a statement about Not that way. morality. <coughs> we have a group of children, you know, in the schools that tells us we're talking about morals.
Jacob and Esau had four elder kids. They had some more brothers. But when nobody's looking, I don't feel something. <laughs> So I conclude with a prayer that's on page seven of this handout. Together we pray. God of love and hospitality, you challenged us to be kind to others in the same way that you are kind to us. Help us to recognize your face in all who come to us. Help us to be our hands and heart and face to all we meet. Help us to welcome others in your name and to create a true sense of a family here at Holy Family. Amen. Amen. Before we stop this recording, we just want to remind folks next week we'll be back for the ministry of serving at the altar. We'll see if we have any current or former altar servers who might join us for that lesson. The week after that is proclaiming the word, standing up. It's not about being a reader and reading a reading. We'll talk about that two weeks from today. How do we proclaim the word of God? at Mass, and uh, the week after that, we'll be on Eucharistic Ministers. Cool. Thank you all for coming this evening. Appreciate you. Thank you. Have a good night. Becky, how do you do this? Oh, finish with the...